On a very hot, average day in June 2017, a man woke up in his giant home in the suburbs of Houston. He is a rich man, known online as Dope Boy 210 This is just one of his many properties, with just one of his expensive cars parked outside. Downstairs, he hears a bang. The reinforced steel anti-raid door is bearing the force of a battering ram. It didn't budge, a good purchase. The windows, however, were just normal glass. They shattered. The man then got on his knees, interlocked his fingers behind his head, and waited. As the SWAT team entered the house and surrounded him, he shouted in defiance, you have nothing on me. Little did he know, the authorities had been watching him for months. The rest of his crew was already in custody. This was the end of his operation. The search for the fentanyl king of the dark web was now over. This video could not be possible without the brilliant write-up by wide journalist Benoit Morin. You can find a link to this article in the video description below. Born just outside Baghdad, Iraq, Allah Muhammad Alawi was just a teenager when the Americans arrived. He didn't understand exactly what was going on, but the country was quickly thrown into disarray. Alawi's uncle, however, knew that the situation was one that brought opportunities for a young, intelligent boy who knew much more English than his peers. The Americans needed locals as guides and especially as translators. He pushed his nephew, Alawi, to apply, despite the role being much more dangerous than it sounds. The Al-Qaeda had no patience or mercy for Iraqis who helped the foreign invaders. The bodies of people caught were constant reminders left to rot for days hung from electricity poles, or torn to pieces dragged from the back of cars. But Lowey wanted to go to medical school, and the US Army would pay $1,350 per month for his help. And so when they accepted his application, he left for Rashid Air Base to begin a life-changing experience. As a fast learner, both socially and practically, Lowey noticed trends among the US troops. For instance, many of them were taking steroids. This presented him the opportunity to make some extra money, dealing the substance on the base and earning himself a quick reputation, one that saw him lose the job. This didn't stop him though, as within months he was hired again by a private contractor, AGS Acom, who were building maintenance depots at Camp Taji. While there, Alawi discovered that he would soon be spending most of his time behind a computer, which turned out to be perfect. There wasn't that much work to do, and he could use this time to teach himself how to code, as well as how to hack. Mostly for fun, at least for now. It's here that Alawi met Eric Goss, a 25-year-old Texan man who would go on to become a lifelong friend, though for now, they just bonded over their love of hip-hop. Before long, Alawi had a new reputation on a new base, not for selling drugs this time, but for hacking the network, leaking people's emails, and general mischief. This base, however, decided to keep him around, but cut off his internet access and instructed everyone to keep him away from unsecured computers on the base. To soften the blow, Alawi built a computer at home with his comparatively high salary for the area and began building his own apps like an Iraqi dating website. Somehow, this young man was pulling in over 5,000 US dollars a month just from these side hustles. Alawi quickly realized, however, that he had outgrown Iraq. There was little to no chance of growth compared to the United States, and so he set his sights on the special visa program for people who had helped the US government during their time in Iraq. A flight was booked, with Alawi set to land in San Antonio, Texas on September 12, 2012. The Attorney General and the FBI are announcing the results of what they call the largest international operation. Focusing on a dark web marketplace known as Genesis Market. Authorities say the site had 80 million sets of digital fingerprints for sale. Unknown to Alawi and most of the world, by late 2012, a whole new world of technology had been spawned. The dark web had appeared, an entirely anonymous browser giving access to a new area of the internet. 
as well as a digital currency that many people were claiming to be untraceable, a new form of money that will take over the world, Bitcoin, and a new way to buy, sell, or otherwise trade illegal substances, services, and items with the explosive growth of a website called The Silk Road. These three things created a perfect storm of circumstance that was about to shake up the entire planet, and Alawi would very soon be caught up in the middle of it all. The FBI calls it the most sophisticated criminal marketplace on the internet. It's called The Silk Road. It generated roughly $1.2 billion in sales. Alawi's time in Texas didn't really go to plan. He wanted to follow in his uncle's footsteps to become a doctor, or failing that, to become an IT professional, perhaps create a startup in Silicon Valley. Admiral goals, but ones that were going to be difficult for what was now a poor immigrant living in temporary housing and using food stamps to eat. He tried to focus on school, but more importantly, he had to focus first on survival. That means a full-time job to pay the bills, less time to study, and certainly no time for a social life. Luckily, Alawi always found himself in rare circumstance, ones with opportunity, and he quickly found himself in a house share with a fellow Iraqi translator. What he noticed, just like on the American bases, was that American college students like to do drugs, mostly weed or pills this time. He seized upon the opportunity and began dealing to the students. This, of course, was a slippery slope. Very quickly, it became apparent that school was holding him back from a much easier income, one that involved many more substances for sale, such as cocaine. By 2014, Alawi was officially a full-time dealer, dropping out of school but still hanging out on campus to sell his product. On January 14th, 2015, Alawi and his dealer were stopped by police while carrying some of their stock. The car was searched, a gram of cocaine, 10 Adderall pills, and almost 100 Xanax pills were located. The pair were of course arrested and charged with the manufacture and delivery of a controlled substance. For Alawi, however, he had no priors, so he got off with a slap on the wrist and some community service. This should have been the warning that would deter most people from continuing down a path of self-destruction. Not Alawi though. He was going to go far beyond what he thought himself capable, not in the pursuit of education, as he had done previously, but in the pursuit of something much, much more sinister. Greed. Alawi now sat in the bedroom of his meagre shared accommodation and opened his laptop. He double clicked on the program called Tor, also known as the Onion Router. Tor is the gateway to an entirely different internet service that is commonly referred to as the dark web. He then navigated to an address for the most popular underground marketplace for all things illegal, known as the Alpha Bay. A prompt appeared for his login details. He typed out, Dopeboy210, his username. A notification bell appeared red in the corner, a sign of pending orders looking for his product. He marked them as fulfilled and began packaging homemade pills into small envelopes, dropping them into a ready-to-mail pile. The next morning, he went and dropped them off into a post box, ready to be transported around the country to eager customers waiting for their medicine. You see, months prior, Alawi had been introduced to the concept of the dark web and yet another opportunity for a smart, motivated young man. The dark web by this time in 2015 was still somewhat of an unknown, but not so much of the Wild West as people thought. The Silk Road had completely legitimized the concept of a global underground market. It allowed for people to buy things in a much safer environment, and way less people were getting caught, both buying and selling, compared to the usual street operation of hand-to-hand. -hand. When the Silk Road was closed, it initially created a power vacuum, but the best markets always rise to the top. That is before they are also shut down, raided, or replaced. At this point, the dark web represented a place of infinite opportunities for low-level dealers like Alawi a place where small-time operators could grow an empire without violence or a massive organization. And where the Silk Road had walked, Alpha Bay was now running. Reported to be almost 10 times the size of the Silk Road when it closed down by this stage in 2015. It was now something most people had heard of, 
the concept that initially shocked the world with the rise of the Silk Road seemed mundane, and people like Alawi were keen to take advantage, still under the illusion that the whole process was entirely anonymous, difficult to trace, and covert. The account DopeBoy210 had been started on May 23rd, 2015, and Alphabay was already servicing hundreds of thousands of transactions daily, most of which were drugs, but some of which were stolen credit cards, guns, and other services. Thousands of these transactions now belong to him. He started simple, but very quickly. A small operation with a pill press from eBay, colouring and binding agents from eBay, and methamphetamines ordered from Alphabay. If he was going to move his business onto the dark web for anonymity, it made much more sense to buy from the site, limiting his exposure to face-to-face -face transactions that might get him caught. He was also using shortcuts on the dark web. Essentially, he was buying other people's drugs to create his own fake ones. When people thought they were buying Adderall and Xanax, they were actually buying meth instead, created using the right materials to hold them together, with the right colouring and even legit forged stamps. It wasn't long before Alawi figured out that this could go even further, which is when he started to order packages of fentanyl from Chinese vendors on Alphabay, an opioid drug said to be 50 times stronger than heroin and 100 times stronger than morphine. Instead of selling other, much weaker pills like OxyContin, which would be difficult to get a hold of and also turn a profit, he could simply create his own pills using a tiny fraction of fentanyl and claim that they were other different drugs. This worked, of course, because they got people high, and people were ordering them by the thousands. Within months, Alawi was upgrading his production facility and moving into his own house to store the product. He had to buy a better commercial pill press capable of pumping out thousands of pills per hour, and his supply was now limitless to meet a growing demand for his online business of over 80 different products most of which were fake, and almost all using the same two ingredients, meth and fentanyl. What Alawi was ignoring, or didn't care about while expanding this empire, was that these ingredients were seriously harming his customers. He was essentially printing money, since a small amount of fentanyl could create an incredibly large number of fake pills, so much so that his life had changed completely. He was recruiting friends to the organization in order to keep up with the demand, and to also try to insulate himself from making massive amounts of local drop-offs by spreading the operation across different cities, as well as, I guess more importantly to him, starting to live the real life of a dope boy. Buying expensive luxury cars, renting opulent homes, popping expensive bottles of champagne in exclusive clubs. He was now living a dream, a completely unrecognizable life not just to anyone who knew him just a year ago, but to himself. That teenager who grew up wanting to follow in his uncle's footsteps back in Iraq, becoming a doctor, helping people to heal, that boy no longer existed, nor did the dream of a tech guru with a startup in Silicon Valley. Instead, Alawi was living an unsustainable life, the life of a man who was dealing in death entirely for his own greed, and nothing more. A life that by day was laughing, partying, and feeling invincible as Ala Alawi, but by night, the life of the dark web fentanyl king. UTSA campus officer Hunter Westbrook was no stranger to chasing a joint here or there since he returned from active duty in the Middle East. College students like to smoke weed. Who cares, right? But it was his job to find it, either way. And it wasn't just weed anymore, but pills like Adderall too. And something even worse, something new, was that students were overdosing at a higher rate than ever before. It was like nothing the school had ever seen. Each report that crossed his desk came to the same conclusion. Meth overdose, meth overdose, meth overdose. Something really weird was going on, and it was way above his pay grade. By spring of 2016, Hunter had chased this as far as he could with the limited power, and was now working directly with the San Antonio Police Department. He sat in a coffee shop across from a local narcotics officer, and they traded information. He was handed a document that had a name, Ala Alawi, a Middle Eastern man who used to be a student but dropped out. The tips that they'd received said 
He had been selling weed and then pills on campus for years, some even pointing out that the pills causing overdoses were coming specifically from Alawi. With solid intelligence like this and impossible to ignore statistics, it wasn't long before the feds got involved. The Drug Enforcement Agency and their local task force came in and took over the case. They began testing the drugs that they were finding on campus, and they found that not only were pills containing meth, but some also containing fentanyl, a drug that was bringing the United States to its knees, with overdose deaths skyrocketing from 1,663 in 2011 to 18,335 in 2016, and rising year on year as it made its way through the country. As soon as they knew fentanyl was involved, this became incredibly serious. So the DEA set up to arrest Alawi, right before an informant contacted them with yet another tip about his operation. Alawi was actually a massive, big time dealer through his darknet operation using Alpha Bay the website. He wasn't just dealing a few pills on the street, he was selling tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands, and earning millions of dollars. But the only reason the DEA ever knew about Dope Boy 210 was because of Ala Alawi's negligence. When he changed over to the dark web and the anonymity that it provided, he didn't follow any proper operational security procedures. While he was now technically untraceable using Tor to hide his location, he still lived in San Antonio, a place where he'd spent over a year dealing drugs face to face with students, some of which were now overdosing from his product that he still couldn't resist selling despite having almost infinite business and money from his online store. If he'd began on the dark web, it probably would have been much different, but there was no way to erase his real world footprint and the DEA were now watching his every move. The only reason he was still walking free was that the DEA didn't know how far it went and they wanted to catch the whole operation in action. Instead of a few pills and a couple ounces of weed on another college campus, they were going to bring down a nefarious dark web drug lord, a big time dealer, potentially the first ever fentanyl dealer that they'd caught from the massive web of underground marketplaces. But the DEA still had one issue to overcome before they could put him away. The San Antonio office were old school, I mean think of where they're located. They were used to busting cartels, and they knew nothing about the dark web, Alpha Bay, Silk Road, cryptocurrency, none of this new stuff. Luckily, UTSA campus officer Hunter Westbrook was a millennial. He watched the news, and he had access to Google. So they kept him around. Still, they were hitting some snags. You see, the US government wasn't very keen on giving them state money to buy speculative currencies like Bitcoin and order drugs on the internet. But eventually, permission did come through. On March 17th, 2016, Hunter Westbrook sat at his office in the task force building, surrounded by federal agents and local narcotics officers. He logged into the government approved Alpha Bay account, already loaded with a few thousand dollars of government purchased Bitcoin. He then navigated to Dope Boy 210's now very familiar store page, seeing the thousands of glowing reviews and the dozens of illicit products. He chose a few to order to himself at the campus mail delivery lockers. He chose 500 Adderall pills for $1,400 and one ounce of cocaine for $1,200. The order was processed and approved. The team congratulated each other and then got back to work. After a few days, Hunter drove to the drop-off location and opened the locker. Inside, he found a familiar looking envelope. He had of course seen these hundreds of times now since mail was being stopped and searched more frequently in the area. When he opened it, he found 447 Adderall pills, but no cocaine. He got back in his car and headed to the office with the spoils of victory on the passenger seat. Although he couldn't help but feel annoyed that not only was Alawi selling laced drugs that were hurting people, but he'd also just scammed the US government. When he got back to the office, he did open an appeal, claiming that half of his order never arrived, but Alpha Bay of course sided with the big time vendor who had great reviews and not the first time buyer who just so happened to be the United States government. Everything was going well for the DEA task force and on the flip side of the situation, life could not have been going better for Dope Boy 210. He just solved a long term problem. You see, he had a ton of Bitcoin from his empire of fentanyl on Alpha Bay and was savvy enough to know he couldn't just transfer them to a centralized exchange and cash them out into a bank account. 
the IRS would surely find out. They even had special investigators for this. Coincidentally, it's how they caught some of the Silk Road vendors, tracing Bitcoin between addresses and then getting records from exchange websites. Instead, he needed to find a way to trade Bitcoin to a real person for their cash. Meaning, other than the Bitcoin in the address, which nobody would know as is, there would be no paper trail. Luckily, he'd found a business partner on localbitcoins.com and was trading his illegally obtained digital currency for Stone Cold Cash, initially in person, but later online. He paid Kunal Kalra, a Californian Bitcoin zealot, a fee in order to facilitate more than half a million dollars in transactions at his cigar shop in Los Angeles. So what was Alawi doing with his newfound and laundered wealth? Well, exactly what you would expect from someone who called himself Dope Boy 210 Down payments on houses, a Maserati Gran Turismo, Louis Vuitton bags, VIP booths at clubs, liquor, sneakers, suits, watches, short-term thrills and things to flaunt his ill-gotten wealth, basically really smart purchases for someone who's running an illegal empire. By early 2017, Alawi had earned over $14 million in his less than two years as Dope Boy 210. Of course, he paid for everything in cash, often walking around with designer backpacks full of $100 bills from the Bitcoin trades. He had correctly assumed that Bitcoin to cash meant he was invisible to the IRS so long as nobody reported him, but he was also incorrect to assume that his life was invisible to the DEA. Nobody cared or was watching his transaction history because they already knew who he was, what he was doing, and they were following him everywhere he went, both physically and online. What Alawi didn't know, however, was that the pills he was selling had caused multiple overdoses across the country already. Not just the meth overdoses, where everyone so far had recovered, but fentanyl overdoses, which are considerably more serious. One such case had led to the death of Mark Mambala, a Marine stationed at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina on April 14th. But if Alawi had known, would he have cared? You see, the method by which Alawi was creating these pills was not at all scientific. There was no guarantee that each pill had the same dose, or that a dose was correct in the first place. Some pills had more than others, some had none at all. Pills were being pressed without any proper cleaning as well. Meaning, despite the fact none of the pills were what they were supposed to be, some were not even what Alawi thought they were. He must have known that this was inconsistent, especially with a substance he must have known was incredibly potent. This is how he was creating his wealth, building his empire, and he clearly didn't care. It was now time for the curtain to fall. The DEA had to make their move on Alawi and his organization. Lives were being lost and the operation was now mapped out to include just Alawi and a handful of acquaintances on a website that they couldn't touch. There was no more reason to wait. And so on the morning of May 17th, 2017, a man immediately recognizable as a utility worker knocked on the door at one of Alawi's houses. He then told the occupant that the power was out and that it would be a while before it was back up. The hard hat and fluorescent jacket where a man walked away, back to a nearby staging area where his colleagues, the other DEA agents, were waiting to pounce. This was all a setup, a plan to get the dangerous occupants out of the house to avoid the risk of loss of life during their raid of what they knew to be Alawi's main stash spot. Knowing, of course, that without air conditioning, no one in their right mind would be sitting inside of a hot house in Texas all day. And they were right. The occupants left, and the DEA agents wearing hazmat suits approached the house. They smashed down the door and performed a sweep for weapons and drugs. Every few minutes, an agent came out and placed illegal items on the ground at the designated area. Two pill presses used for making the drugs, 500 grams of fentanyl powder, which according to the DA would be enough to kill about a quarter of a million Americans, 500 grams of meth, 500 grams of cocaine, 10 kilograms of fake oxycodone tablets made with fentanyl, four kilograms of Adderall made with meth, five kilograms of fake Xanax that contain meth, a Ruger revolver, and a Sieg Sauer pistol, as well as an AR-15 style rifle and a loaded Glock. Even though the DEA knew roughly what to expect, this was a considerably larger operation than they had initially expected. And exactly while this was happening, two of Alawi's friends and members of the organization 
drove by the house, Uno and Robinson, they immediately contacted Alawi, warning him. Instead of doing the smart thing and running away as fast as he could, Alawi asked them to pick him up. They did. He then instructed them to drive to the house. They did. The car drove by slowly, the three of them watching as the DA swarmed the area, bringing their operation completely to a close. They were so, so close to being caught, but they drove away. And as they did, the three of them tossed their phones out the window. They were fucked. It was all over, but they were at least still free. Immediately, Alawi began planning his escape back to Iraq. You see, he'd been sending money to his family the whole time, and they were now wealthy and affluent. If he could make it down to Mexico, he could then fly to Iraq and evade every consequence of his actions. The group split up, each taking a burner phone with them and heading to a different city. As days turned to weeks and nothing happened, they were questioning whether anything ever would. The Dope Boy 210 store was now inactive, money had stopped flowing into Alawi's organisation, the product was all confiscated, but nobody had been arrested, nobody had been even close to being arrested. They even started to think that they got away with it all. Alawi then packed up in California and headed back to Texas. He called up his friend and worker Eric Ghost, and they hit the VIP section of a club just like any other day in their recent high-flying life. They celebrated their escape, but really, it was one of their last nights as free men. As they were drinking a $500 bottle of champagne, a joint operation was being planned and it would be launched just days later, striking at three different locations. Dallas, San Antonio and Houston. The first two raids found Uno, Robinson, Al Salihi and Ghost, all who had worked directly with Alawi creating and distributing the drugs. Kalra, the Bitcoin guy, was also arrested, but the bulk of the initial task force was making their move on a massive house in the suburbs of Houston. The house with the $10,000 reinforced door, something you totally need as an average citizen in the suburbs. The DA battered the door, but couldn't get it to budge, so they then smashed the window and entered the house. Alawi didn't try to run again or really put up any fight, despite them finding a 45 Colt, 12 burner phones, two money counters, a Bitcoin wallet, and some more drug creating substances. This is when he told them they had nothing on him, defiant until the very end, but it was all over. The hunt for the fentanyl king of the dark web had now ended. Despite Alawi's initial assessment of the government having nothing on him, it took only a couple of weeks for him to plead guilty and enter an agreement. The government likes this, as it saves them months of a trial everybody already knew was a foregone conclusion. This allowed for some leniency in his sentencing. He was indicted by grand jury in June of 2017 for conspiring to distribute fentanyl, meth and cocaine, possession of a firearm during a drug trafficking crime and conspiracy to launder monetary instruments, of which he pleaded guilty to conspiracy to possess with intent to distribute 400 grams or more of fentanyl resulting in death or serious bodily injury, as well as to using a gun during a drug crime. The government alleged that during his two-year spree, he earned over $14 million and sold more than 850,000 pills in total, being tracked to as many as 38 different states. Alawi, as many criminals do, pleaded with the court for a second chance, telling them that he made a mistake. He asked for mercy. The court denied his plea, instead sentencing him to 30 years in federal prison and an order to deport once his sentence concluded. Uno, Robinson, Al Salihi and Kalra all pleaded guilty to crimes committed during their time working for Alawi and were sentenced to between 18 months and 10 years depending on their level of involvement. Eric Ghost, however, very strangely escaped with only five years probation. Today the Department of Justice announces the takedown of the dark web market Alpha Bay. Just a month after the arrest and sentencing of the organization, a massive coalition of federal agencies across the globe moved on plans to take down Alpha Bay, the current largest dark web marketplace in the world. The website was, by this time, facilitating over a billion dollars of transactions per year, contributing massively to the growing epidemic of opioid addiction and fentanyl overdoses plaguing the United States. Within weeks of closure, however, 
dozens of new dark web marketplaces had launched, attempting to fill the void left in the ever-growing market, proving to many that while short-term victories come from long-term investigations and resources towards bringing down these marketplaces, it really does nothing to the reality that they are a hydra. No matter how many heads you cut off of the beast, two more will grow in its place. Just like the Silk Road brought about dozens of markets who were eventually succeeded by Alpha Bay, just like Alpha Bay was succeeded by Hydra, and just like Hydra will be succeeded by whoever wins the current struggle. People will never stop buying and selling drugs. While China has cracked down on traffickers and prevented much of the fentanyl flooding the United States, Mexican cartels have more than made up for the missing product with chemicals that they import from China via legal export. In 2022, the DEA seized more than 379 million potentially deadly doses of fentanyl, more than the population of the United States in just one year. The amount that they catch is thought to be a fraction of what really exists, raising the very important question, if you cannot stop the desire and you cannot stop the supply, what are you even doing? People are buying what they think to be safe doses of relatively safe drugs, but they're being given deadly doses of something invisible to the naked eye. When does it end? One mistake taking a counterfeit pharmaceutical can result in your death. And this is the business of illegal narcotics, and nothing will ever change while ever that business exists in the hands of criminals who put profit above their customers' well-being, which will be always. Just like Ala Alawi and his organization, when one falls, another takes its place. For this story, it was Alawi. For tomorrow's story, who will it be?